Hello and welcome to another edition of another book review. This week I'll be reviewing Poverty by America by Matthew Desmond. I'll talk very briefly about the author, go into an overview of what the book is about, talk about what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it, who I'd recommend the book to, and finish off with what I will be reading for next time. I've reviewed Matthew Desmond's book, uh, Evicted, a few years ago. I'll leave a link below to that video if you want to check it out. Suffice it to say, he's a very successful sociologist. That book, Evicted, followed uh, individuals in Milwaukee who were going through the eviction process. Uh, I believe he won a Pulitzer Prize for that book. It was very, very lauded. I think deservedly so, and it was a very good piece of writing in terms of balancing people's personal stories with the ins and outs of the eviction process, as well as giving maybe some solutions to uh, what he saw as solutions to the problem uh, surrounding eviction. This book, uh, Poverty by America, is really Matthew Desmond's look at poverty. He questions why America, despite being the richest country in the world, still has this lingering issue with poverty and has been uh, more or less unable to make a dent in the number of people who are in poverty from roughly 1980 to roughly 2020, despite spending roughly two and a half times what they were spending in 1980. By they, meaning the federal government, has increased spending roughly two and a half times. And he ultimately comes to the conclusion that poverty exists because Americans benefit from it. Wealthier Americans and middle class Americans benefit from poverty and, uh, and is the reason that it has been so stubborn to, to stamp out. So it is a very provocative, provocative hypothesis and I think uh, it is a book that I think will get people talking and I think people will have strong reactions to it. Um, I think he has a ton of footnotes and citations if you want to dive deeper into his research, it's certainly there. I think uh, he, this book, the best thing I can say about it, I think, is that it's a good jumping off point for really any group of people, from people who are starting to think about their role in the world and talking about, you know, if you are a college educated person, do you have responsibility to other people? If you happen to find yourself to be affluent or upper middle class, I think all the way to, you know, down to high school kids and thinking about their lives. I think you should just give it to a book club. Uh, I think this would be a really great book club book because I think, uh, like Evicted, it is one of those things where I think a lot of people are able to put this outside of their, their usual thought processes. And I think Matthew Desmond writes in such a way, again, to kind of get the blood pumping and get people angry. Sometimes it's at Matthew Desmond, <laughs> but, you know, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but... I think it's written in that way to provoke, and I think he's really good at writing to provoke. Um, so in that sense, I think it's a good jumping off point if you want to go into other books after this one to get a deeper dive of what he's talking about. Dream Hoarders is a book I've reviewed in the past. Uh, I'll just list a bunch of books uh, real quick, and then I'll leave the links below. The Coming of Neo-Feudalism, uh, Civilized to Death, Dream Hoarders, uh, Boys and Men, Catherine Newman's book, no shame in my game. Um, I'll leave all those links below if, if I feel that there's a book that's similar to this one uh, that I've read that I think is Sc Scott Galloway's Adrift that I kind of fit that fits in uh, with that mold. He does cite Newman, and I know he cites Matt Brunig, who I'll mention in a little bit, as well as Richard Reeves in a couple places. So the book is really well researched, and I think that uh, to his credit, I don't think this is something he slapped together. Its book is relatively short. And it's a, it's a little bit of a page turner. Um, so I think those things were good. I think also he does kind of go quickly over the last 40 years in terms of workers and the uh, lack of worker empowerment. He talks about the rise in temp workers. Uh, he talks about deindustrialization. He talks about stagnant wages, especially for working men, as well as just in general fluctuating wages as people are kind of brought into and out of the workforce much more often than they used to be in the past. And I thought those things were all interesting. There's a couple of big cons that I had with the book, and I think the, there's a, they're really in no particular order, but one of them was, at times it feels like the book is, um, it talks about poverty, and, but it also talks about working poor people, and when the federal government looks at poverty, it has very specific guidelines for federal poverty levels of where it needs to be uh, in terms of how much money you need to make to fall under poverty for the federal guidelines. States, some states have different guidelines than the federal government does, but in terms of when Matthew Desmond talks about poverty, I got the sense that it's much more of a wider 
net that would encompass people we normally wouldn't think of as being impoverished. He says at one point, you know, there are people who are making $50,000 in Miami. They're not technically in poverty, but what else would you call it? And so part of the issue I had with the book is unlike Evicted, which is very, very focused on this one particular subject, which is uh, evictions in Milwaukee. This is what the system looks like. This is what happens to people when they go through the system. Here are possible ways for them to get out of the system. This book is really not that. The book is much more on his personal feelings on poverty and really the moral failings of America to allow it to continue to happen. Um, so that's much of the book. There are bits and pieces in between. I mean, there's maybe a handful of them of people's personal experiences with poverty. One of them is one of the women who was profiled in Evicted. Uh, I believe her name is Crystal. And he goes through her story and her story is essentially her parents were drug addicts she was born, uh, she was undiagnosed with, uh, I believe it was bipolar until she was 17. She had instances where she was basically thrown out of her housing due to physical altercations with people. So she had a, a long laundry list of, of things that she had to, to deal with. And uh, I don't know, when we talk about poverty, there's definitely part of the thing that in it, there's not a lot of space in the book that gets devoted to it. He mentions a couple people who have had substance abuses who were also dealing with poverty issues, but then he kind of he wants to not talk about that, not talk about mental health, but that's such a large part of it. When Matt Brunig does did a video a couple weeks back, I saw that was a review of one of the articles that Matthew Desmond had written in connection with this book. He looks into the quintiles, and Matthew Brunig, I believe, is an economist. He looked at quintiles, so five, if you placed every American who made more than a dollar in a given year, he took that data and he basically said, well, how many people are able to, if they make less than the poverty level this year, how many of them are able to be out of poverty the next year? And I think the number he came up with was between 40 and 60%. Another way of saying that is between 40 and 60% of people who are in poverty one year aren't necessarily gonna be in poverty the next year. So you do have something akin to homelessness in that you have a group of people who are maybe cycling through homelessness and there are people who are permanently or nearly permanently homeless. The, the question is, and this book doesn't really get to it, it's just more of, I think, the book, the sense that I get in this book, I feel that Matthew Desmond wrote this because to point out what he sees as the moral failings of America, of Americans being unable to answer this problem. Um, the, the issue I had with that is Ultimately, his proof of that, his proof of, of that are certain things like the inability for the government to um, increase unionization in America is one of the big things and stop exploiting workers. But when you get into things like exploitation, you know, is he talking about, again, the minimum wage? Should it be a living wage? Where do we go? Where does it draw the line? Does it differ from state to state? And all those things are real considerations. And so when you talk about exploitation, what does that mean and how do you de define exploitation and where does it end in a capitalist system? You know, is your explo exploitation and my exploitation, are we going to view those differently depending on if you have children, if you don't have children, if you're single, if you're married? Like, it's just, to me, it's an infinite number of rabbit holes that you're gonna kind of go down um, if you begin to view it from that, that point of view. And so that was my issue with it was I felt it was unfocused. I felt like if he had focused on poverty, these are the people who are essentially permanently impoverished. They will not be able to move forward. What are their issues? Their issues are probably things like drug addiction and mental illness, or they just are not in an area where they're able to find work. So that would be like things like relocation or job training. So th those would be the things, if you believe that, Part of being out of poverty is having to work to be out of poverty. If you're able-bodied, then, it, then it, it paints a different picture of things. And he does get into solutions about, it. most of his solutions are the money, like how much money would it take for us to get people out of poverty? And that's certainly part of it. That's certainly part of the issue. But the, the other part of it is, well, how do you deliver those funds to people, especially people who are unbanked? He mentions at one point that you know the banking system uh, has a long history of exploitation itself, and he, look, he points to racialized issues in the past where banks were discriminatory against different groups of people, especially black people. He points to that and says, well, they're still doing things like charging overdraft fees, and he gives a number of $12 billion. And while $12 billion is certainly a lot of money, 
if you look at the overall banking sector, you know, how much money can it be? And it, it, it kind of is this weird thing where he says that you're exploiting poor people, you're forcing them to do this thing. There's no, there wouldn't be any real cost of it, but there would be cost to the, the individual. It's really just a, how would you go about doing this where there's no harm to that person? And the answer is you can't. And even if you could, if you do ch make that change, I don't think it's demonstrably going to, it doesn't go far enough to me to, to add to the point that Americans by and large want people to be poor or people to be exploited because a bank they happen to go to has this policy that they may not be aware of. And I think the bank would rather, much rather you have a 300,000 mortgage with the bank and they could make money off you off the long run than off a like $200 overdraft charge or a $33 overdraft charge. Is that exploitative? You know, if not, why not? And so some of those things, there's a lot of blurred lines and there's a lot of blurry definitions of things. You know, who qualifies as affluent is never really defined in this book. He gets into one point, he talks about the tax breaks that are given to the wealthy versus the tax breaks that are given to, to poor people. And it's a whole, that's a large portion of the book. And he feels that like rich people take advantage of these, these systems and they don't see these tax breaks as, as, as handouts by the government. But things like food stamps they see as handouts to the government. And part of me, one, and he mentions, he basically says, here's the actual tax rates if you take out things like the mortgage interest deduction and you take out things like 529 savings plans and you think, take out things like student loan deductions. And I think, and again, uh, I read um, The Debt Trap. I read Paying the Price. And if, I read Fiona Hill just mentioned it like two books ago that I read. If you want to argue with me that uh, college does not, in fact, benefit society as a whole, and it largely benefits the individual, I'm more prone to that argument than most people. There's, you know, half the country who believes that college, for the sake of college, is beneficial to society as a whole. And if you follow that logic and that belief, then you having a college interest deduction for your interest that you pay on your, your college student loan makes sense. The 529 plan, back to the Richard Reeves of Dream Hoarders, it's not that much, and he doesn't really get into the possibility that I believe that just there's a lot of people who just don't know about the 529 plan. In this book, he talks, in this book, Matthew Desmond talks a little bit about the uh, idea that people don't take advantage of their benefits, and one of the reasons they don't take advantage of their benefits in terms of like food stamps or other TAMF benefits is that they just don't know about them. He goes a little bit further and says that's technically welfare avoidance. And, you know, if you don't know about something, can you really be avoiding of it anyway? But anyway, he says, well, that's, that's, that's them not knowing about it, and that's the ignorance of it. And to me, it's, again, if you believe that college is a benefit to people and benefit to society, I don't know why you wouldn't extend, extend that same courtesy to people who are less affluent about the 529 savings plan. And so the 529 savings plan isn't the reason that people are in poverty. It's just not. And um, he points to that, and he basically says, well, and to the mortgage interest deduction. And then when you look at the mar mortgage interest deduction, you break it down of, well, what is the mortgage interest deduction? The mortgage interest deduction is really a, a giveaway from the federal government to state and local governments. It's ultimately what it is, because it's a price that the consumer would normally bear. They don't bear it. The federal government bears it. In that sense, the incentive is for someone to build a larger house or buy a larger house. And um, Matthew Desmond rails against this. This is terrible. He mentions that Trump has brought the limit down from a million dollars to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You know whether or not that that is is more socially acceptable to Matthew Desmond. He doesn't really seem to have an opinion one way or the other, other than he really does not like the mortgage interest deduction. But the reason that it benefits people is to say that a larger house, someone is paying more in property taxes, typically. So the community around that person would tend to benefit. So if you're paying more money into a property tax, it's going to fund your firefighters, your schools, your police departments. Again, Matthew Desmond doesn't really come down on where the cutoff is for affluent. He says things like, well, there are people who have speedboats and people shouldn't have speedboats. And you're like, okay, so are we talking about $200,000 a year? Like where, where is the line for someone where you can basically say, this is wrong. You shouldn't have this deduction. And my whole thing and the way I look at it is if you look at the federal if, in fact, federal tax code and you look at the history of the federal tax code and breaks were added and breaks were taken out, everybody gets a break. It's like Oprah. Everybody gets a car. 
So earned income tax credit is for people who are typically poor people. The mortgage interest deduction is for typically for people who are middle class people. You have capital gains that are given to uh, wealthy, pe wealthy folks um, who pay less money in taxes. And the money that they would normally pay if those rates were normalized income, he gives the number for that in the book and actually wasn't as high as I thought it was going to be. So, you know, you could, in, in essence, if you felt that there was a moral imperative for the top 20% of people to pay more taxes, I think that that's something you can make the argument for. He goes beyond that, though, and says, you know, it's not just poor people. It's also working poor people in some ways. And then the question that I, I ultimately just found myself asking, because he does bring it up in the book, why not the universal basic income? And he says, well, it would be too expensive. But then he points out that the TAMF program, for instance, as a program that pays people who are in poverty uh, is rampantly uh, has problems with it in, in many, many states. And he points to only two states in the country. One is a state, one is the District of Columbia. If you're watching this in the future, there, it may be two states. But right, as of right now, Kentucky and the District of Columbia is the only state, the only two areas of the country, munis municipalities, that pay more than uh, half the money that they receive from the federal government uh, to recipients of TAMF. He goes, Mississippi is probably the worst because, you know, look up the Brett Favre case and the Ted DiBiopsi stuff. I'll let you, you know, scan the internet with all that. But there's essentially all kinds of discretion that the, that the states have to use welfare funds. And, excuse me, many times they use them in ways that maybe a lot of people would say are inappropriate. Well, the way to get around that would be just to have a UBI and just say, hey, we're giving money to everybody. That would be a way, the way around it. That would also allow people to help working poor people who maybe are above whatever arbitrary poverty line you have because at the end of the day, someone has to do the calculation and if you make more than $1, you're out of it and if you make less than $1, you're under it. So in some ways, it is arbitrary. So why not just have that? That would also allow for you to worry about things like people falling out of the workforce, people who are, were working and got laid off. It would allow for if people want to spend money for education for their children or if they want to spend money to move to a different place, they could use it. Now, would it be very expensive? Well, yes, but that doesn't seem to bother him about anything else. And so he basically says when, when looking at this problem, you know, there's all kinds of money. We should have an abundance mentality and there's you know, trillions of dollars that are offshore. I think he, the number he, he cites is a trillion dollars. And that's the number I've also seen cited that's basically owed money owed by corporations and uh, the top taxpayers that have w been withheld from the, uh, the federal government. I'm assuming that that means that that's money they factually owe under the current tax code and not money they should owe if these loopholes or whatever were closed. But given that given, let's say that that's what it was. I know the Biden IRS is increasing the number of, of people uh, to, to go after that money. So maybe they'll, they'll bring home some of that money back and maybe you can increase the uh, charitable giving to people just going to increase the amount of money for in these po in these poverty programs in order to decrease the the poverty rate. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I've covered up some of it. Like I said, it, the book does jump around quite a bit. There are times I wrote a note down: Is the book about income inequality? Is it about racial inequality? Is it talking about the working poor or people who are in poverty? The answer is yes. So it talks about really all those groups. And again, this kind of goes back to my call for the UBI. If you were going to do this, the benefit of the UBI is you would not have to have different programs for different people. You wouldn't have to say, well, you know, you're homeless and you're a single parent, so you go into this bucket, or you're homeless and you're a veteran, so you go into this bucket, or you're not homeless, but you are disabled, so you have this. Like, it would just kind of do away with a lot of those things. And he's right, it would be expensive and there may be people who fall through the cracks, but my counter argument to that would be there will always be people who fall through the cracks. Like he mentions in the book, his friend who's a man named Wu, who was according to him 40 years old and he, I guess, stepped on a nail and unfortunately he had his leg amputated. And so he had to fight to get disability. He had to fight to get social security though. You know, the way Matthew Desmond explained it was uh, Wu didn't work one of those jobs where they collected your social security number, which is another way of saying Wu was working under the table, which is, hey man, you're 40, you couldn't find five years within that to, to find a job where you were, you were earning social security. I don't want to get into the ins and outs of that because I don't know the situation. But that, that's why. So always there are going to be people who fall through the cracks. And the thing that would benefit people who fall through the cracks is, 
Matthew Desmond doesn't really mention until the very end of this book, and that's charitable giving. And if you look at the amount of money, and he just has a real flippant line about it and says, you know, well, if charity worked, then it would have worked. And you're like, but the thesis of your book, the, this, the, what makes this different than every other poverty book that's come before this is that there are a large number of Americans who benefit from the system and want it to continue. And if they're giving million, billions of dollars each year to charities, most of whom are going to benefit people who are impoverished, doesn't that cut against your argument pretty strongly? And if you look at the amount of money given by, uh, in total philanthropy, and I pulled this up online before the video, it's like $330 billion roughly is money given by Americans to other Americans. That's excluding um, money given by organizations and uh, uh, corporations. So you're talking about a relatively large number of money. If I compare that to the waste, fraud, and abuse number, that's oftentimes cited, which is around 140, is that two, two and a half X. So the money's going somewhere, and if it's getting into the pockets of people, in some way, shape, or form, it may not look like money, it may not look like hard cash, but it may look like babysitting, it may look like meals that are being bought, it may look like fuel that's being given. It could be a lot of things that aren't really reaching the, the, you know, the official poverty line but that money is going somewhere. Now, if he wants to do a book on whether or not that, that money is actually reaching people that's given by charities, I would actually be really interested in that. But he doesn't really deal with that at all. And, and again, when you're talking about poverty, there are different ways that you're going to measure it, and everybody's going to look at it slightly differently. And if you all you have to go on is the federal number, this is the income that you're you're making. It is a question of if there are like in like kind in kind services that are given in lieu of cash. You know, things like babysitting, you have volunteers, people who volunteer to uh, sit for, for kids while, they're, uh, while their parents are going to school or working a second shift or whatever. I don't think that would officially make it to the, the poverty, poverty line as far as being recognized. Uh, so you have, you know, what are equivalent of millions of hours of, of volunteerism that people do every year that he just kind of, you know, as the Jerry Seinfeld joke goes, like a French king just like scrolls away. And he just, you know, and he calls on people to do more and people to do more and people to do more. And uh, I think there are people who are going to look at this and I hope there are people who uh, dive into some of these numbers and look at them because I do think that there are instances where there's some things that I think are a little fast and loose with the facts. But I think I've talked for too long on this already. Uh, I've hit, I think, all my points that I wanted to hit. Um, the hyperbolic language is going to appeal to some people, and it's not going to appeal to other people. I do wish it had been closer to what it was in Evicted, but I think in order for it to have been like Evicted, it would have had to have been much more uh, real, reined in and much more kind of small and compact. And I don't know if he could have told this whole story that same way. I felt like sometimes he told stories that were just about his personal life, and that to me wasn't as interesting. I felt that they were kind of antidotal stories and if you're someone who's studying poverty I'm sure you're going to have stories about people who are working 80 hour shifts um, there are a lot of people who don't aren't in poverty who work 80 hour shifts so I think it's a question of how do we best you know and he mentions the, the minimum wage and the raising of the minimum wage being beneficial to people and uh, I know that that is true for a lot of people and so to me it's a question of well where is the what is the end goal what does it look like you know, like I said, he talks about kind of racial inequities between housing in the United States uh, as far as housing starts here, and he looks at zoning, and he looks at uh, things like just lack of housing in general of being built. You know, those same problems are also true in Canada. He doesn't really, you know, he, he seems to be focused on racism in certain places, I thought, a little too heavily. And then at the end, he kind of gives like, here's my vision of the future. And I thought it was one of those things where it was just like, the vision of the future for him is is basically living in a very diverse neighborhood with a lot of people who chip in and, and kind of work together to do these things. And I just said, I think that's true for a lot of Americans who, who like that. And I don't have a problem with anything that you said. I think that exists for a lot of people already. And I didn't quite understand what his point ultimately was. To me, it was like, are you okay with it? Like people living in suburbs, are you not okay with that? It kind of goes back to at what point are people allowed to have freedoms to kind of live where they want and do what they want? And if they don't, they choose not to live the way that you are cho choosing to live, Matthew Desmond, are they wrong? Like, 
what are you actually calling for here? And so uh, there's a lot there. And I think different people are going to get different things out of it, which makes it a really good discussion book. Um, I would love Matthew Desmond to talk to an economist about some of these things because I don't think he thinks – I don't think there's as much money as he seems to think that there is, especially, again, if you talk to Americans and say, well, what's more important, you know, the defense, the defense budget, poverty, or climate change, or Social Security, <laughs> or, or – or. so I think he does view it from – he does have a section about abundance and how he believes that there is enough there – to, to solve these problems if only people change the way that they look at things. And, and you know, I, I did write down a note that basically said, you know, uh, is there a cutoff for economic insecurity? Is there a cutoff where someone says, no, I'm no longer going to be economically insecure once I hit a certain amount of money in my 401k? And he hasn't really touched that either. I know that was a hypothetical that I, that I wrote, but there was the whole thing in the, the book. I was just, the whole time I was reading it, I, I was like, I think he has to basically say, because his thesis is that this is a problem that everybody has caused, that you know certain people aren't causing it more than others, which is you know demonstrably false. There, he kind of notes there in certain places that you know the people who are most likely to oppose zoning, new regulations, or new housing tend to be older homeowners. Does that mean I'm not a homeowner? I don't have to do anything? And I think he would say, well, you have to be a, an advocate for public housing and part of me wants to go well do, do I have to <laughs> like why why is that and again I think if the UBI uh, was t taken up as a policy position by Matthew Desmond I think it would be a very interesting conversation I think he does himself I think a disservice because I think this book preaches to acquire that Ari is going to agree a lot with Matthew Desmond and I don't know if he does anything to bring other people along I will say he, at one point he says you know we should be honest, and there are some things that are zero sum, uh, meaning you're going to have to give up something for us to get other things in return. He doesn't tie that to education and affordable housing and people, you know, moving into areas where school systems tend to be better. Though it's pretty obvious that would likely happen at some point. You're going to have to build more schools if you have, um, you know, have to split the school and move people around. You know, teachers are not an infinite resource. And so those things aren't really considered. And so, uh, yeah, so that's that's the book. I've gone along, rambled along enough, but that's what this book made me want to do. So Poverty by America, did not like it as much as I liked Evicted, but I think there's a lot there that people will find interesting. And uh, I think that's a, an interesting discussion. Finally, I'll just leave the, the one thing on the racial wealth gap. He mentions the racial wealth gap, which is a thing and is, has been a thing for a long time. I, I, he doesn't mention kind of an apples to apples comparison of the racial, racial wealth gap, which would be two people who are the same age, because obviously as people age, uh, they tend to accumulate wealth if they are building wealth. And Philip Bump talks a little bit about this in his book, The Aftermath, I'll leave that below. But in general, just uh, white people tend to be much older. The median white person I think is almost twice as old as the median black person, as well as other racialized groups because the baby boom was so overwhelmingly white. So it's not necessarily like a false comparison, but there's another way of looking at it that I thought would have behooved him to ha have done that. Um, and I questioned back and forth in reading this book, like, could you have written this book without talking about uh, the racialized problems? Should, could you have put it into a single chapter? Or should it have been a separate book? So I, when reading it, I don't know. I, I'd be interesting to see what people thought of it. If you did read this book and have strong feelings about it, please let me know. Um, I think for what it is, it will spark conversation, which I think is what it's designed to do. I know Matthew Desmond's been doing the circuits and stuff on it and has done a ton of press for it. So I'll put my links below to everything I've mentioned if you want to check me out there. If you also um, want to uh, like the video, please do. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Um, and next time I'm going to be we're finishing up Blind Sight by Peter uh, Watts. Until next time, bye.